Welcome to Electrified. It's your host, Dylan Loomis. Quick shout out to my newest patron, Henry L. Thank you for choosing to support the channel. Real quick from yesterday's video, the stock market was indeed closed and I totally forgot, so apologies for that. The CEO of Xpeng has said, I'm visiting the US for a longer period of time this time and dropping by to test the latest version of FSD and Waymo. He said he has Tesla's 12.3.6, but he was asking anybody if they have 12.4.1, you can lend it to me. Thanks. He also asked his social media followers what they would like to see in a comparison between FSD and Xpeng's version of it, XNGP, aka Xpeng Navigation Guided Pilot. On Weibo, he said he welcomes Tesla's FSD to China and that Tesla has great autonomous driving technology and brand. Perhaps most importantly though, Late Post has said that Tesla's V12 has of course displayed good results, making the end-to-end -end model an emerging industry consensus and more car companies in China are starting to experiment with that route. So picking up some of the clues that Tesla has been leaving, it'll be interesting to see over the next two years what companies like Neo and Xpeng can come up with going the end-to-end -end route. Replying to that news story, Elon said the Chinese automakers are by far the most competitive. We just can't forget that a majority of Chinese EV makers still are not profitable, so long term, they're going to have to figure that out at some point. Ordinarily, I would not take time to cover Tesla stock price targets, but in this case, we actually get to start seeing how they're thinking about Tesla and autonomy. RBC dropped from $293 down to $227, saying we lower our Tesla robo-taxi value and now allocate a bigger revenue share to service providers like Uber and Lyft. RBC lowered their price per mile assumption from 96 cents down to 81 cents, reflecting the economics of fleet operations in a 15% IRR. They also implemented a new revenue sharing model, allocating 25% to service providers, 10% to software providers, 15% to OEMs like Tesla for vehicle leasing, and 35% to fleet operators to cover expenses and maintain a 15% IRR. Before, RBC was looking at two scenarios Tesla owning the entire robotaxi operation and then fleet operators using Tesla software with another manufacturer's vehicle. They added two new scenarios, including service providers using either Tesla's app or another company's app. They said Tesla would capture 100% of revenue if it was fully self-owned, but only 10% if another manufacturer's vehicle and a service provider's app were used. But here's where this starts to fall apart. They said when robotaxis reach mainstream global usage, which they're predicting around 2040, there will likely be multiple software providers, fleet operators, and OEMs making purpose-built vehicles. But you're also allocating a bigger revenue share to service providers like Uber and Lyft. Why? Yeah, so there's like three parts of the ecosystem here with, uh, with robotaxis, right? You have the software, you have the vehicle, and then you have the app. I think there's going to be a lot of software providers. I think Tesla will be a big player in this, but there are a lot of folks making software for autonomy. The vehicle, lots of car companies are going to make the vehicle, but the app, that's one where our analyst Brad Erickson on the internet team talks about how that's very sticky. It's it's a moat. Just look at how you use your apps today, right? Like how many apps are you going to have on your phone to order a car, right? I have one. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, that's really, I think, where a lot of the power lies. And that's something that I've raised. And they collect right now for every Uber fare I think you take, I think 25% of it goes to the app, goes to Uber, right? Not the driver. So that's a big lion's share for, for, for that stickiness. So that's why we changed our view on that. Uh, and we think actually that the app is going to have a lot of power. Tesla is going to make their own app, sure, for, for sure. But we do think some of these other app makers who already own customers are going to have a lot of power as well. You heard what he said, there are a lot of players making software for autonomy, but what is he actually talking about? Because he did distinguish that from the actual app. So to me, it seems like he was talking about the software or the neural nets that would actually allow an autonomous vehicle as if they're all just the same and everybody's just gonna figure it out. Now, given that they were modeling out to 2040, okay, sure, maybe that's the case, but how about the next five years? For me, it's just very hard to get on board with any analysis that says Uber and Lyft are actually going to get a bigger revenue share. When you take the driver or the supervisor out of the equation, I don't understand how any of 
these other companies will be able to compete on cost. We know the Cybertruck charging curve software update improvements are supposed to come sometime in the next few weeks, and they're saying it should be a 30% improvement to the current charge rates. Specifically, the ability to add 154 miles in 15 minutes. I remember a few years back when I was watching Matt Farrell's Undecided regularly. I was just starting Electrified and he used to talk about Tesla a fair amount. Honestly, at the time, I didn't really know much about a VPN like Surfshark, but I knew I wanted to support Matt and it was super affordable with a 30 day money back guarantee. So I figured I didn't have anything to lose. Here we are almost four years later and I'm still happily using Surfshark and they're the sponsor of this video. And yes, even Elon has mentioned how easy using a VPN actually is and I can confirm. A VPN encrypts all of your online activity, making it private and not even Surfshark keeps logs of your online data. There are a few reasons, but one of the main reasons I use Surfshark is to limit the data that my internet service provider actually has on my family. They already know our names, our address, our phone number, and we're not doing anything squirrely online, but even just our whereabouts, if all of that information was ever compromised, well, that's certainly not good. And Surfshark is not just for mobile phones when traveling or a laptop when you're at a coffee coffee shop or a friend's house, but it's also for all of your home devices as well. Surfshark allows one account for an unlimited number of devices. So if you'd like to support the channel and more importantly, take your privacy back for you and your family, you can get an additional four months free using my code electrified at surfshark.deals slash electrified linked below. And just real quick, I've seen some confusion out there when it comes to Giga Nevada and the expansion, 4680s and Mega Pack, so I wanna just clear all of this up. January of last year, Tesla announced its new plans for a $3.6 billion expansion to Giga Nevada that was going to look like this. At the time, they said part of the expansion would be a 100 gigawatt hour 4680 cell factory with the capacity to produce enough batteries for 1.5 million light duty vehicles every year. The second part of the expansion, a high volume semi factory. But Tesla has since changed its plans at least when it comes to the semi factory expansion. This screen grab shows the current setup of Giga Nevada with the blue squares being Panasonic's part and then the red squares being Tesla's part. And then the yellow areas were the original planned expansion. But as we've seen from the Heinrich Zane flyovers, at least part of this expansion is going to be completely detached from the existing building. So yes, at least when it comes to the volume semi-factory and these original plans from January of last year, that part has been changed. We don't know for sure if they're changing anything with the 100 gigawatt hours of 4680s. And on that front, I'm seeing people out there saying Tesla's using 4680s in the mega pack right now. I do not believe that's the case. As far as we know, all of Tesla's 4680 production is high nickel chemistries. They are not making any 4680s with LFP chemistries yet. So Tesla is still importing LFP prismatic cells from CATL. I thought it was important to note after yesterday's video talking about this 100 gigawatt hour announcement from Tesla that it could be in flux to some degree because these expansion plans, again, have changed for the semi. So based on Elon's recent comments about 4680s, I think it's reasonable to expect a lower number than 100 gigawatt hours, at least for the next few years. And for now, all 4680 production is going into the Cybertruck. I believe at this point, Tesla would still want to use 4680s in the Tesla Semi, but they may have to hit some more cost down targets before being able to commit to that. If Tesla can scale the Semi up to 50,000 units per year times, let's just call it 900 kilowatt hours in each pack, that's about 45 gigawatt hours per year just for the Tesla Semi at volume. For a frame of reference, right now in Austin, Tesla's 4680 production is hovering at an annual run rate of between six and eight gigawatt hours per year. As we We've seen that did not happen overnight as Tesla started making 4680s in Austin toward the end of 2022. In theory, the next iteration of this 4680 factory in Nevada could go faster, but 
time will tell. The top three Google search result listings for Tesla news today, three articles all talking about an Arizona woman and a baby trapped in a Tesla because the battery had died. I'm sharing this because in the news segment, they interviewed Tesla owners and none of them knew about Tesla's manual door release. I can't have even one viewer of Electrified be in that camp, so if you own a Tesla, check the owner's manual and your version to find your manual release. And here's the diagram for the rear doors in the Model Y. It's our duty to be educated on our vehicles. Martin Vieca, the former head of IR at Tesla said, still today, even in the US, when I tell people the Model Y is the best selling car in the world, I get a, there's no way that can be true look every time. What do you reckon the number one selling car was in the world last year? Toyota. Close. What would you say if I told you it was a Tesla? I wouldn't believe it. 1.2 million units the Model Y sold last year. Second place was a Toyota RAV4. And this year, the Tesla sales are down. There's lots of uh, stock on it has been delivered, so it's sitting there waiting to be sold. Would you ever consider owning a Tesla yourself? Uh, no, no, because the jury's still out on what happens with the battery at the end of the life, you know, and it, they're too expensive at the moment. Maybe another five years or ten years. Yeah, what would you say if I told you it was a Tesla? It was a what? A Tesla. Never heard of them. An electric car. Oh. It was a great video idea from Ryan on X, and then Martin also said, for what it's worth, personally, I've always been pro-advertising. Around 1% of revenue spent on ads, digital, and TV would, I think, be margin accretive and mission accretive. Tesla did $97 billion in revenue in 2023, so 1% of that would have been roughly $1 billion a year on advertising. I want to read the end of this new note from Wedbush and Dan Ives. It's all about the pace of data center AI-driven spending as the only game in town for GPUs to run generative AI applications and they all go through NVIDIA. NVIDIA and Microsoft are the first derivatives of the AI revolution with the second, third, and fourth derivatives of AI now starting to form in the market, which speaks to their 2024 and 2025 tech bull thesis playing out. Today, Elon quote posted a picture of Tesla's GPU cooler fans in Texas that we shared yesterday saying, we are nothing without our fans. Elon then said, size for 130 megawatts of power and cooling this year, but will increase to over 500 megawatts over the next 18 months or so, aiming for about half Tesla AI hardware, half Nvidia and other. Play to win or don't play at all. This brings up a point I think not enough people talk about. Tesla is spending huge amounts of money on compute and everything that goes with it, from cooling to power and the whole nine. Of course, I think most of us are pretty confident in the long run it'll be more than worth it, but there's going to be a transition period where the spend is way up. We're talking billions of dollars per year. And for now, what we're getting back is actually just an incremental march of the nines in increasing FSD safety. So at least for a time, the CapEx outlays are going to greatly exceed the financial return for Tesla. But it's also true that part of this major CapEx outlay, specifically Tesla's hardware like Hardware 4 and AI5, will also be going into Optimus. And Elon did clarify specifically for the half of this supercomputer in Austin that will use Tesla AI hardware. That's going to be mostly hardware four and then some dojo. Then Elon said hardware five or AI five is going to be the second half of next year. The AI5 computer has 10x the capability of hardware 4, and Tesla makes the whole software stack. Given the importance of all of this to Tesla's future valuation, I think it's good to recommit to memory what Elon said at Investor Day. We have hardware 4 run hardware 3 in emulation mode, so we'll continue to make significant progress on hardware 3, but later this year, we'll actually bifurcate continue working on hardware three, training on hardware three, but then do separate training on hardware four. The expansion at Giga Texas will be dedicated hardware for video and inference. Hardware four has cameras that have about four or five times better resolution. And depending on how you count hardware four, it's about anywhere from three to eight times better than hardware three. But everything you're seeing thus far is just hardware three, and we still have a long way to go before we reach the limits of hardware three. So hardware Hardware 3, I think, will still do amazing things, but Hardware 4, I think, will probably do about five times better. Then Hardware 5, which comes out toward the end of next year, is 10 times more capable than Hardware 4. But given that all of the progress we're seeing with FSD and Optimus is using Hardware 3, 
AI5 is actually going to be 50 times better than what we're seeing in use today. That's because Elon said hardware 4 would be five times better and AI5 would be 10 times better than that. On X, Mark said every March of the nines will approximately 10X the required compute. To which Elon said, not as high as that, but still very high. The March of the nines of reliability requires massive data and compute. And again, based on what we've seen of version 12, I think many of us are confident about the future, but we're still yet to see how the improvements and the rate of improvement actually go. That's because as I've said before, Tesla no longer has the ability to just write a line of code for a specific problem. So don't misunderstand me. I'm not second guessing at all Tesla's strategy here. I'm just saying, I think we at least have to acknowledge the level of risk that this massive spend on data and compute actually entails. But again, it's also true that this hardware and compute spend will directly propel Optimus development development as well. A local news station in Alabama ran a segment on some new fast chargers going up in the state. All we can see is that it's from Blink and this gentleman just mentioned Hyundai. But during this entire segment, they said nothing about the connection type or the speeds, nothing about the site itself. As I've said before, I'm actually quite excited to see what IANA does in this new seven automaker partnership. On that front, we still don't know which hardware IANA is actually going to use, but it's apparent that Hyundai and Blink are indeed in partnership. I also found this charger out there that actually has the Hyundai brand right on it, but it does say powered by Blink. We did just learn though that EV charging hardware provider ChemPower just set up its headquarters in Durham, North Carolina, which as we recently talked about is also where IANA has decided to set up its headquarters. And not far away in Charlotte, North Carolina is Alpitronic with their HQ. If you haven't been paying attention right now, the Carolinas are booming for both EV production and EV charging hardware. Outside of the supercharger network, it really feels like IANA is going to be the United States' best shot at significantly improving the public charging infrastructure, which as we know is one of the most common complaints and reasons given why people are hesitant to buy an EV. A better route planner announced on X they've teamed up with Rivian to bring their charger reliability scores to all of their users. Using data from Rivian's connected fleet will route you to the most reliable fast chargers for stress-free long drives. You may remember though, last summer Rivian acquired a better route planner, so this integration shouldn't be a surprise. When it comes to Starlink Mini, it turns out for now, they're only going to release a limited number of these products and it's actually going to cost $599. Elon did imply a few days ago, it could be as low as 250, but for now they're keeping it high with the aspiration to reduce the price tag. Starlink's VP of engineering said they're ramping production on the Mini and that it'll be available in international markets soon. But for now, Starlink Mini is still going to be invite only. Tesla stock closed the day at $181.57, down 1.78%, while the NASDAQ was down 0.79%. It was a lower volume day, trading about 17 million shares below the average volume the past 30 days. Don't forget, take Elon's advice and check out Surfshark linked below. Take advantage of those free months. Hope you guys have a wonderful day. Please like the video if you did. You can find me on X linked below and a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters.